So it seems uh, we are not able to connect back to uh, Abe Karar. So joining us now is Craig Hughes, uh, Vice President of Architecture from ENBD. He will be talking to us on a topic of does lipstick work? Uh, yes, this is different, catchy. I will let um, Craig explain to you what it's all about and how lipstick is related to APIs. Over to you, Craig. Thank you, Prashant, uh, and welcome everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so this is not necessarily something that's specific to APIs. Um, I'm going to talk about the concept of lipstick, and this is not a beauty show. There's a reason for it. Um, but for this talk, it's it's a case study. I'm going to take off my architecture hat. I'm going to pretend that I'm just a customer of a bank where this has happened. Um, but while this doesn't pertain to APIs specifically, it's it's about digital failures in an organization. And the reason why it has relevance here is because APIs are generally used to facilitate uh, digital transformations. So I'm going to talk about why Lipsticks works. Um, to give you a bit of background, um, first the agenda is a bit of background into who I am and, and why, why it's relevant to this conversation. Uh, quickly have a look at a few digital failures um, as to what is the general pattern and why things generally fail. I'll tell you why we're talking about Lipstick. I'll then tell you my story um, as the use case. I'll have some reflections and then we'll go through some closing comments. So not a very long agenda, um, but hopefully you have something you might find interesting. Now, just a bit of background. Um, like a lot of you in this room, I, I'm an expatriate. I'm originally from South Africa. I moved to Ireland um, where this use case took place in 2001. From Ireland, I moved to the UAE. In the UAE, I moved to Denmark, and from Denmark, I moved back to Ireland for a short period of time, and then back to the UAE. So I'm back here for the last three months. The beauty of being an expatriate and working in different countries is you get to experience not only the people and the culture, but the banking, um, the banking industry in those countries and how it actually affects people and the difference between the different types of banking. Um, and because I'm also working in different countries and have presence in other countries, I tend to transfer money across from different countries um, on a regular basis. My son is studying in the UK, so I transfer money to him. And I found that I actually do use some of the more uh, fintech related products like Wise and Revolut because they actually perform better than banks in some instances. Um, but that's not the topic for discussion today. Today, I'm going to have a look at the concept of lipstick. So if we have a look at why digital strategies generally fail, um, Peter Bendor from the Everest Group says that continuous change or a fatigue from continuous change is one of the top reasons why 70% of digital transformations fail. And that's people in the organization getting tired of continuous change from the organization, continuous change from senior management, continuous change of approach and strategy. But he also cites that a lack of upfront commitment or failure to take an intuitive sprint approach or even taking the technology first approach is also reasons why strategies fail. Second one is the agility is is, is following uh, or pursuing agility without really knowing what it means. If you ask ten people what is agile or what is agility, you more than likely get ten different answers. Most of them around the um, the agile ways of working. Professor Michael Wade of IMD says this is too narrow. Um, organizations should be should be looking at organi organizational agility, not just ways of working. And organizational agility is made up of three key concepts, not just one. The first one is hyper-awareness. It's an advanced sensing capability to really understand what's going on external to your organization and internal. The second one of is the informed decision-making. It's able to make decisions based on the evidence you've gathered from the first, from the hyper-awareness. And the third most critical agile process or trait is to be able to, the ability to execute fast to put those decisions into practice and they take action quickly. The third reasons why digital strategies generally fail is because we tend to focus on silos. You can often hear organizations talking about digitizing their supply chain or marketing or different areas of the, of the organization, but allowing projects to digitize silos normally ends up in disappointment for a number of reasons. And the first is that Taking something that is analog and digitizing it is often perpetuating the issue. It doesn't necessarily start uh, or create, uh, fix the issue. The second thing is that silos are often the cause of the problem and not the reason for the solution. 
And the third one is if you focus on silos within the organization, you miss the, 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 the opportunity to integrate between those silos, which is where probably APIs come in in their best place, is, is, is breaking down silos and creating cross, uh, cross-functional capabilities. Finally, reason strategies fail is that we miss the duality of digital. We tend to always focus on creating something new, something fun and exciting. Whereas looking at digitizing existing business models and creating new innovative business models is also a way to improve, improve your digital strategy and APIs facilitate that. But let's talk about lipstick. Why am I talking about lipstick in this context? And um, there is a saying, it was first phrased in uh, the 1930s, so it's fairly old, it's been on a while. More recently it was used by Barack Obama and apologies to if it's going to find a piece, some people might find it offensive, but the phrase is lipstick on a pig. Um, and what it really means is you can take something that is not necessarily the best that you have to offer and put lipstick on the outside to pretend or give the facade or the idea for your customers that this is really new and new and, and quite cool and fancy. And the reasons why we tend to do these is because it seems cheaper and because it's customer facing. We make changes on the periphery of our organization because that's where we get the biggest impact from our customers and from our shareholders. We get to present cool new products to our customers. Um, and we get the customer recognition. They can see something tangible in their hands. And our shareholders get the attention as well because they can see change in the organization. But generally doing this and taking this approach, um, it's superficial. Um, you, 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 while you're creating this facade of something nice, it's only externally focused. Internally, you may still be dealing with a lot of problems. You haven't really fixed up the problems that you have internally. You're still stuck with legacy and past decisions. You're just trying to put a facade in front of them to try and make it look like you, you, you're actually moving ahead in a digital strategy. And unfortunately, from an open banking perspective, I've seen a few banks do this themselves, where open banking has become a facade into the bank. It doesn't necessarily use the same strategy of open banking to create internal APIs that can create consolidated services or reusable services. Rather, the open banking becomes a new channel within the organization, a new facade a new channel that, that, that people can use or that industry can use. So this is why I'm talking about Lipstick. It's, it's about understanding that if you're going to do something on the external, you need to make sure that internally you're still covering um, and, and fixing some of your issues in the past. But let me tell you my story. Let me give you the use case. As I mentioned before, um, I've lived in multiple countries and I moved from South Africa to Ireland. I spent a number of years there before, before moving to the UAE and Denmark and back to the UAE. It's in this period that I moved between Denmark and back to Ireland for a short term and then from Ireland back here. When I left Ireland, I kept my savings account, my current account and my credit card account active because I had subscriptions in Ireland that I wanted to maintain. So on a monthly basis, I would send money to my current account. And from the current account, I would fund my credit card account because some of the chances of these subscriptions running off the credit card. And that kept them active. When I moved back to Ireland last year um, for a short period of time, I had some surplus funds because I'd moved in country and um, I wanted to put them into my savings account. And I did. I transferred them to, into my savings account using the mobile application that the bank had provided. Um, the following month later, I needed to use those funds to pay for my son's rent in university and a few other things. So I needed to get funds out of that. And when I went to the digital application to do that, while I could see the balance in my savings account, I couldn't transfer that balance out of the savings account into my current account. It seemed like it was blocked. So I phoned the help desk and I called them and said, look, I have this problem. What is going on? They said, yes, an AML flag has been raised. The money laundering flag has been raised against your account. You need to visit the branch. And you need to take with you some proof of identity and proof of your address. Fortunately, this was towards the end of COVID, so the branches were open. Otherwise, I'd be in real trouble. And I went to my local branch and walked up to the lady behind the counter, explained my story. And she looked at my account. She said, yes, I can see well enough that the AML flag has been raised against your savings account and it's been blocked. And then she said, not to worry, we can sort it out. Now, standing next to her was a young um, lady who was going to training. And what this gave me was insight as to what she was doing, because she was narrating everything she was doing to this person next to her, who gave me an idea of what was happening behind the scenes. 
So while she was doing this, she was explaining to this lady that she had to go into this application and fill these details in here, and then go into that application and fill these details there, and then switch between these applications and do all that stuff. While this is going on, I said to her, I have my proof of address and I have my proof of uh, identity. Do you need these now? She said, not to worry. Uh, we don't need it now because your identity and your proof of address is already against your current account because that's remained active. So we're just going to transfer that to the savings account. So not to worry, we don't need proof of address or identity. I said, fine. I let them carry on. And eventually she finished. She said, right, that's completed. Uh, to finish the process, we need to do a transaction within the bank. So you need to withdraw money from your savings account or deposit money into it. Um, or do something in the bank. I said, that's fine. I want to withdraw some money from my savings, put, put it into my current account. That will perform the transaction. She walked me over to uh, a counter, and then this happened. I filled in two pieces of paper. From a digital operation to an analog, I filled in two pieces of paper. And it wasn't the worst that happened. Because what happened after that is when I got to the counter and gave these two pieces of paper, and the person behind the counter said to me, can I see your proof of address and your ID, please? So I didn't need it for removing a money laundering flag, but I did need it to deposit and withdraw funds from my account, which is a very analog and old process. Needless to say, it took four hours for the funds to go through and eventually resolved itself and everything was back to normal. But as a customer, there's some reflections that I need to go through. Why? Was the money laundering flag raised on me? I'm the same account holder. It's the same bank. I'm the same branch. I use the bank's facilities. And the reason is it's a disconnected infrastructure. It's silos and legacy migrations. I know that this organization has a very back-end legacy and heavy mainframe system that doesn't cope well with the digital world. So in order to facilitate an online digital world, they created shadow copies of their bookkeeping system and this shadow copy is where all the transactions happened but in a digital way they wanted to analyze and do ai and, 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 and analytics on data to pick up money laundering flags and they were doing this on the bookkeeping engine and the bookkeeping engine was being fed overnight from transactions from the shadow system which means when the transactions ran in the bookkeeping engine all context was lost so the flag that was raised was invalid but from a customer's perspective, I didn't know that. It just seemed weird. It just seemed awkward. Second thing is, why was my account inactive? And I wasn't told anything. I wasn't notified. Now, I know we shouldn't let people laundering money know that we're investigating them. But it's very much a, a, a behavior of being account-centric. So again, focusing on silos. There was no notifications. I had to call the bank. It's not very customer-centric or very good customer journey. Thing is, thing is, why did I have to go to the branch? If everything is digital, and if we're trying to be in a digital bank, why did I have to go back to a very old antiquated analog system? Why did I have to bring ID with me? A lot of the fintechs nowadays, I can take a photograph of myself holding my passport, and that's more than sufficient. But as a bank, I had to follow a very old process and prove that I lived somewhere. And then again, the AML verification. I didn't need to prove ID to that because they could do it in the operating system within the bank, but I had to prove ID when I wanted to do an old-fashioned transaction. It's, it didn't make sense from a customer's perspective. But because I've, I've been with the bank a while and I actually happened to work there, I do understand internally what happened, but from a customer's perspective, it didn't make sense. So if I look at the four mentioned um, reasons why digital strategies fail, it seems like it just in this single use case, three of those strategy failures were met. There was no breaking down of silos. The, um, there were silos created in the organization to deal with digital and silos to deal with legacy and book bookkeeping systems. There were silos within the branch and silos within the channels. Those two did not meet. Um, and it, it created a very uncomfortable journey that I as a customer had to go through. There was no real understanding of the customer impact of that journey. Yes, in a digital strategy, they went through and said, let's look at money laundering. We can catch out the criminals. We can do bad, catch bad behavior. We can make this bank better. But when it came to rectifying the situation, the thought pattern didn't continue. It didn't look at, well, if we have a false flag, how do we make the customer, how do we reduce that customer impact? Instead, they just looked at legacy patterns that they had in the bank and said, well, you can go into the branch and prove your address and that's fine, we just use that. So using an analog 
um, recovery mechanism for a digital strategy is not great. And also it seemed like they're focused on the strategy only and not only the requirements. So when you're looking at the requirements of doing something, have a look at what is the strategy you're trying to perform, not just the individual components, but rather focus on the bigger concepts. Um, so from those break those, break, those breakdowns of digital strategies, it seemed there was fatigue from continuous change because the full process was not sought out. It was just like, let's just do this and get it done and we can follow the next strategy, it'll come around again. There was breaking down the silos, the big one. It didn't happen. And then missing the duality of digital. You didn't, nothing, if, not even digital, only certain components of it were. So it was creating new concepts, but not upgrading the old ones. So in closing, um, as a final concept, I will say that this is my bank. This is the bank that I work with. And the bank is like my sister. I can say bad things about it, but you can't. It's my bank. Um, and in closing, as a final remark, I just want to say that no APIs were hurt in the making of this presentation. So thank you very much for your time. If there's any questions, I'm here to ask them. Uh, uh, hey, Greg. <laughs> so, uh, we'll take a couple of more minutes to have a conversation with you since uh, we uh, wrap up your session also um, went quite fast, I believe, <laughs> or rather became too short. So. Um, I was rushing, thinking so, I was out of time. <laughs> okay. So um, one question. Uh, so quite a lot of attendees from um, on our sessions are uh, predominantly you know, the, the developers who are, say, uh, so one to eight years, people who are you not know, trying to focus on some one or the other technology or one or the other domain to, uh, so they have to build their career. So mm -hmm. You have been playing the role of a tech, uh, technical architect. You are heading the architecture team now. So uh, what would you suggest to them, recommend to them on how, how to go about you know, uh, crafting their career? So because uh, we have seen on multiple of our e events, the people are uh, quite a lot of um, developers with low, you know, one to eight years of experience are coming here to see, uh, to understand more about what technologies are the in things, what do they need to focus on and how to... Um, uh, how to take their career forward. Uh, so you have some things to uh, share, I believe, there. Yes, I suppose I can share some experiences for myself. Um, one thing about IT is that it's very, very broad um, and it branches out incredibly quickly. Um, so try and specialize in one area um, and not one technology, but one area of, of um, what do you call it, um, of focus. I, like, I, I decided in my career earlier on that I saw the promise of the internet in the 90s and I decided that my focus in my career would be internet-based technologies, web-based technologies. So mm -hmm. I stopped focusing on, integrate, on, on, on infrastructure, I stopped focusing on some of the more underlying components and focused purely on web-based technologies. That pushed me into the arena of APIs and understanding web services and everything else. And that's where, so I continually re refined my pr for primary focus areas, not based on technology, but based on concepts. While I still kept my eye on the ground on other areas around me, I became more of a generalist in those areas, understanding the concepts that allow me to facilitate my focus area and where to find the right people to work with. But I didn't spread myself too thin across too many broad, pro uh, too many um, technologies or approaches. So while it's enticing to try and understand everything, it's impossible. It's best mm -hmm. to try and focus on specific approaches um, or patterns than trying to be a generalist of absolutely everything because you'll never be a specialist. You'll be a jack of all trades, but master of nothing. Right, yeah. So um, next one, I mean, uh, you have been, um, uh, you have been playing the you know, active role in the digital transformation uh, since last couple of years. You, you were in another geography, you are in another one now. So uh, where do you see the most internal resistance for the change, this transformation come from the in, inside the organizations? Obviously, you, we cannot say that th there is no internal resistance. There do exist, it, uh, even if pockets of resistance, if not a large scale. but. Um, mm -hmm. They, they are a fact. They are something to be acknowledged. And so where do they come from? Uh, especially when an organization is moving from a, towards an API-first approach, 
uh, where do they come and how do they how 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 is it tackled normally what are those two three things that is generally done it's a very diff- uh, very good question and the answer is not simple or short but i'll do my best <laughs> so where most of the challenge comes from <laughs> is um, not always senior management it's people on the ground so right. if you've been in an organization for a long time if you're used to a certain technology that is your comfort space that's where you you you've been performing for the last number of years that's where you've grown your career and that's where you've got the recognition if you bring in a new strategy that competes against that or or or, or um not what's the word challenges those thought patterns and that direction that you've always followed throughout your career you're going to automatically yeah. put a stop gap against that you're not going to want to go with it you're going to always try and stop it what i found is a lot of people in these positions have become heroes in their little silos they're the hmm. person that manager the project manager who's responsible for delivery is always gone to for advice and that person if they're challenging are always going to say to that project manager you know we have this requirement to do this thing the digital strategy says we should do it this way but it'll take a long time because we have to learn stuff and we have to play with new things and we have to introduce new tele- technology and bring new people on board but like i've done in the past i can do it very quickly just change in the code here and we can get it finished and you can meet your short term objectives and you can get your kpis met and we can all be happy and the strategy will change anyway in two years time Right. It's the short-sighted mindset of individuals on the ground who are not brought onto a journey with the rest of the organization. And that is a challenge I see that a lot of times when a strategy is initiated, it's initiated at the top of the organization and we focus on educating the organization upwards. But we don't bring the organization, the low off the organization along with us on that journey of discovery. The way to I found to work with those is to work with the people on the ground, the experts, the people that have been there for a while. and ask them for their advice on the strategy not necessarily dictate to them that we're doing a strategy but ask them how would you evolve your area of the work into the strategy to get the best out of your area to help you grow and help the organization grow as opposed to saying right we're doing this this is your responsibility now go off and do it right so so essentially the management also the 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 culture from the top also need to be a one of you know listening and being inclusive to get this done right yeah yes uh, the last one probably and uh, next one probably is a little difficult one i mean you may or may not want to answer i believe <laughs> so h- how do you see between the two geographies some of the contrasting things or some of the best from both the areas which you want to highlight uh, that is okay um culture plays a big uh, a big impact in the way people work together um mm-hmm. we all have we we all grown up with a different culture and a different mindset a different way of looking at at life and a different way of looking at our purpose in life or what makes us tick or what makes our society move ahead um and that's apparent in many different cultures um i'm not going to use this region for example because what i love about this region is you have so many cultures in one pot that anything is almost possible but yeah. i give an example when i worked in denmark um we had offices in denmark so we had danish people there with offices in lithuania so we had um eastern bloc people working there and with offices in india and i would do these workshops across these locations uh as part of a training exercise and what i found out is that while the results were similar the thought process to get to the results were different because of the different cultures that were working there the danish people were very much focused on the business aspect and the financial aspect of a specific problem and how to solve that when they went to lithuania they were focused on the technical process how do you build a system to meet this challenge and when i went to india they were focused on the process around what we're trying to do now this is very generalized i'm not being specific here mm-hmm. but it's a general and i know it that three different cultures that three different ways of looking at the same problem but from a slightly different context either business and finance or process or technology depending on where they grew up and what sort of was the importance of their society or their culture right so understanding how to work with those mm-hmm. and understand trends and how people's mindsets work is what i like about this region because you have so many cultures working here it's it's while it's a challenge to understand who you're working with it's also a joy to understand different cultures and different challenges and know where to use strengths and weaknesses of different cultures together 
right so uh, if, if if time permits can i add on some more questions of course you can <laughs> sure so um, what are those say i'm i'm, I'm sure these are, these are some of the things which uh, you no know, uh, some of the questions are coming from the past experiences of you know interacting with the attendees uh, of our event series so again going back to the same uh, segment of developers roughly 1 to 7 1 to 8 years of experience so uh, it's not always um, you know definitely the uh, coding ability plays a part but at a high level uh, what are those top three things that you would look for when you are recruiting a talent uh, recruiting a talent technical a technical talent um, and uh, you no know, what are those things that you feel are generally um ignored by the you know technical resource uh, rather they which they should focus on in terms of growing their career okay um what i look for uh, whether i'm looking for a senior technical developer or a an architect itself um first is the ability to solve problems um not necessarily from a technology perspective but just thinking about the problem in a slightly broader context not focusing mm. purely on the requirement in those requirements but understanding the impact of those requirements and the problem it's trying to solve and then maybe look and saying well maybe there's a different way of solving this so problem solving skills is a big one not just coding skills problem solving skills the second one is um is the ability to communicate effectively so an important part about developing your career is not necessarily only being a good developer or being a good designer or an architect it's about being able to articulate your thoughts your designs your solutions so that people can understand them um so communication is is key to actually moving ahead in any kind of career as long as it's sort of problem solving abilities and then the third one is as i say empathy and understanding people that you're working with and understanding cultures mm -hmm. and things because it's key um but i think that's as you move into senior roles of organization it's, it's understanding that you're working with people not numbers right definitely that that, that plays the that plays the most important part, uh, part and especially in this um, past two years where what we are the industries in general like or rather industries are seeing that great resignation or great uh, whatever you yeah. call it <laughs> right yes. so yes, last one uh, sorry last one um, um, so uh, in um, having played um, worked in organization uh, in their api side now in another one and having you no know, you would have interacted with a lot more uh, larger banks across the globe so what are those uh, say top 3 or 4 areas uh, where these in the in their api journey or in their core transformation journey that the banks in general do focus on so where it, it's as in a trend where whether irrespective of the size or irrespective of those um, banks you know focus uh, in terms of business focus areas as I say as in it's, it's whether it's in a retail or a commercial uh, but still those two three area things that they focus on during their transformation i'm not sure i can tell you three things that they focus on but i can tell you mm -hmm. three things that You forget to focus on. Okay. <laughs> which, okay. Which is great. <laughs> yeah. I, I think any any large organization when they follow some form of digital strategy looks at a right. very high helicopter view of what's required. But when it gets to the details, they expect the people on the ground to do that. And sometimes the people on the ground are still learning and they don't know the nuances of everything that's required. So what happens is they follow a digital strategy and build APIs and build all these services but they're not documented properly there's no there's no contract negotiation and contract development between consumers and producers they just decide I'm going to produce this capability and they develop an API they don't document properly they don't talk to their consumers they don't interact with them they don't manage them properly they don't put them behind some form of catalog where you can discover them or you know how to manage your consumers you know what is required of the interface there's no management and there's no governance applied so it becomes a sprawling mess and then the third one is they don't focus on proper versioning 
So you have interfaces and APIs that evolve haphazardly um, and the organization struggles to keep up. So instead of changing the version of the API so that you can evolve it, they introduce background changes. So the interface stays clean, but it, like lipstick, it stays clean yeah. on the outside, the inside becomes an absolute mess and it becomes unmaintainable, unmanageable. Or what happens is they duplicate. So you have one API with a specific capability of something that needs a slight enhancement. And instead of enhancing and versioning the existing one so that you can manage your consumers, they create a new version. And they grow in a separate path in a separate life. And then that gets replicated. And I've been in organizations where there was a catalog of 13,000 APIs. None of them documented. None of them governed. And the only way you found out what happened was, or what an API was available is you ask someone, um, I need to do this. And they said, well, Bob did something like that. Have a talk to him. Then you go talk to Bob. You find out what well, he actually got it from Joe. Uh, and then you copy Joe's and you create your own version and you publish it and there you go. You're off. Um, and it becomes a maintainable nightmare. So it's while APIs are everyone's favorite friend and everyone wants to do them and talk about them, it's them properly and effectively that leads to most of the problems or the failure to do them properly and effectively. It's not just simply building an interface. There's a lot around it that needs to be governed. Right. Okay, great. So essentially it boils down to, you know, having a API governance structure, a proper API strategy itself and a governance and a set of deciding on that standards and processes to be followed, right? Great. Yeah, APIs are uh, not the root to everyone's problems. They're not the, the root to everyone's victories. There are actually some problems sometimes if you don't do them properly, if you don't govern it properly. Right, yeah. Okay, uh, th thanks a lot, Craig. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us. Uh, share telling us why <laughs> why does the lipstick work or not work <laughs> helping us understand that part and yes taking from so the more time to have a conversation with me uh, thanks a lot uh, wishing That's you all the pleasure. best in your career in dubai region uh, i know you just joined like 3 months before here yeah. okay thanks yes. a lot